my background, man, in the martial arts is, uh, as a little kid, I trained Taekwondo. Like, that was the thing for everybody to do was train Taekwondo back then. And then uh, after that, uh, Little League Sports took over, so I stopped doing the combat sports thing. And then once I got into college, uh, my junior year in college, or well, actually my freshman year in college, I found uh, American Kempo, 1992 maybe. And uh, I think that's when Jeff, St Jeff Speakman's The Perfect Weapon came out. And uh, so I was looking for an opportunity to train in American Kempo. And then from that point on, I just started training and um, went into uh, Kempo. And then I went into the Golden Gloves Boxing. I did that for a while. And then I uh, started teaching, training, and then I found Saxon, started training Muay Thai. And then from that point on, it just kind of took off from there. Yeah, man, I mean, it, just back then, it was a whole different thing to get in, into the UFC. But I found that training with Saxon was the best trainer that I'd ever had. and. Uh, you know, he, he trained me, he trained me like they do in Thailand. And, uh, cause he always, he, he always said Americans are weak. So basically when he started training me, I was his experiment when he first got to Texas, cause he had trained in Hollywood for a long time. So I was his first experiment in Texas. And uh, he trained me to literally try to break me and make me quit. And once I didn't quit, you know, everything just kind of took off from there. But I took the right fights, man, uh, made the right connections to get into the UFC and that I had a goal of getting into the, I think uh, I start, my first pro fight was in like 1990, 99, I think. And then my goal was to get in the UFC by 2002. Uh, you know, I wrote it down and uh, got my first call in 2002 and uh, it just kind of took off from there. I mean, at this point, it's there's so many there's so many different ways to get into the UFC. Um, you got you got guys that pad their records. Uh, I think there was one guy that I've seen that fought one promotion. Everybody he fought had a losing record. He got in the UFC. Of course, he got exposed once he got in the UFC. But you know, that's one way padding your records. Another way is getting in good with the uh, with one of the matchmakers. And so, you know, you have certain matchmakers that have their favorite gyms that they like to put on. And uh, I ain't gonna say no name specifically, but they know who they are. And uh, they let anybody and everybody from a particular gym get an opportunity to get on. Uh, another way to get on, uh, pretty easy. Uh, I wouldn't say easy, but another way to get on is go through the Ultimate Fighter. Uh, I've had a few dudes through my gym that, that got their chance through the Ultimate Fighter with Diego Brandao. Uh, Eric Shelton got his opportunity, and then, uh, and then of course Dana had his his show. Are you looking for a fight? Where he would travel around the country to the smaller shows and and pick up guys that have the that he feels like has the opportunity to do well in the UFC. And now recently they've got the uh, the contender series that that Dana White puts on. So there's several several different opportunities to be able to get in there. But the thing about it, getting in there is one thing, but staying in there is another. I mean, it's cool. I mean, I like the way the Contender Series is ran. It's basically just another fight. Uh, I mean, you just get to fight in front of the, the biggest matchmakers and the biggest promoter in the world, but it's just like any other fight, man. You, you, you at the same time, they get that sort of UFC kind of experience uh, during the Contender Series, but at the end of the day, it's another fight. Uh, you get to fight in the Ultimate, Ultimate Fighter House. I had one of my guys, Antonio Jones, that was on this season's uh, Contender Series. And, uh, you know, it's kind of weird for me walking back into the, into the Ultimate Fighter gym. Uh, it was a weird experience, a weird feeling for me being back in that place because I had been there before. Um, but, you know, overall, it, it's a cool opportunity. And, and again, even with the Contender Series, there's, you know, certain promoters that, that uh, or certain matchmakers that like to uh, give certain gyms plenty of opportunities on the Contender Series. Like, you know, multiple fights to get the opportunity to, to get into the UFC. But, uh, you know, I'm just going to keep grinding like I do. 
Uh, I enjoy building my guys from the ground up. I don't necessarily, when I take on other fighters, uh, you know, I try to add something to their game, but you know, at the end of the day, I've got a core group of guys that I've kind of developed from the beginning, and I'm just looking forward to seeing if I can take a guy from z ground zero and take him all the way to the UFC. Uh, as from a coach's perspective, um, when I have people fighting, I get more nervous as a coach. Um, you know, I've had combined, I've had almost 100 fights from Muay Thai to kickboxing to boxing to mixed martial arts. And uh, for me, I, I, don't get, I don't get nervous, I don't get the jitters, I don't get any of that anymore. Uh, but I feel, like a, a, I feel like a newbie when I've got one of my guys fighting because I actually get nervous and, uh, you know, I try to play it cool just so my guys don't get nervous. But, you know, on the inside, I, I'm nervous. And uh, I just want to see those guys do well, man. I want to see them implement some of the stuff that I've shown them and I want to see them do well and, and be successful. And uh, that's my gratification from, from a coach's aspect is being able to see them reach their full potential and actually realize that some of the stuff that I show them actually works because I, again, you know, I've been there at all levels, coaching and as a fighter. I think for me, coaching was just a natural transition for me. Um, I've always been a great athlete and Whatever sports I was playing, I was kind of always ahead of the curve, and I always found myself like coaching my coaching up my backups and and things of that nature. So coaching just kind of fell into a natural transition for me. Uh, I guess it's kind of like uh, not not everybody can coach, but that's just one of those things that just came natural for me from being able to uh, focus in on what the coach is saying and then transition that stuff for me to be able to comprehend and then actually translate it and give it to another guy that's behind me and you know I've always been like that it's like like in basketball your point guard is supposed to be your coach on the court when I was playing football and basketball and I, I played point guard when I when I played basketball and uh, I was always like a coach on the field when I played football because I knew every position and uh, that was just that was just an easy natural transition for me Well, my athletic background is I was a great, great track athlete. Uh, I was a high school All-American. Uh, I actually still have two of my high school records. I have the record in the triple jump, which I went 47 feet, four inches. And then I also have the, uh, I still have the 400 meter, 400 meter dash record in my high school. And I ran 47.49 in the 400 meter dash. And then I also played football, I was all district. Uh, and in college I played football, I actually football played for my school. I uh, was an All-American in high school, player of the year, what? Not All-American in, in high school, but I was All-American in, in college. First team All-American, player of the year. Um, I think I was all conference three out of the four years I was there. Um, so my background in athletics is, is extensive. Played high school basketball, I was the only three sport letterman at the time in my high school and I was that for my junior and senior year. I might have, might have been my sophomore, no, it wasn't my sophomore year. I had a couple of, other, couple of other older guys that were uh, three sport lettermen, but for my junior and sophomore year, I was the only three, three sport lettermen in the school. And, uh, but you know, I was just, uh, I'm just able to pick up sports. It's just kind of a, a natural thing for me to be able to pick up stuff. I remember I used to play, pick up soccer with some of my Mexican friends and they were tripping because I would hit goals that they wouldn't even expect me to hit. And, uh, you know, I played a little bit of volleyball. Like, like I, just, I just pick up stuff pretty easily. But of course I pay attention. Like when my daughter's playing sports, when she's playing volleyball, I pay attention to what the coaches say and how they're coaching the girls. And then I take that home and I translate it to her and I coach her the same way that, that their coaches do at the academy.
For me, my most memorable moment is uh, knocking out Daniel Ocasio at the last second of the last round in Brazil with spinning back fist. Uh, I mean, I, I was given a decision. I mean, I don't understand how you get a decision when the guy's laying unconscious, but you know, that's no, another story. Most people will point to when I beat Robbie Lawler as, uh, as the thing that they remember most. But you know, I mean, I've got a lot of, I've got a lot of highlights in my career, man. It's, um, but. But the two that stand out, those are the two that stand out the most. Um, leading up to the, to the Lawler fight, I mean, that's actually a fight that I wanted to begin with and the UFC didn't want to give me. Um, but I asked for that fight and finally, uh, I ended up fighting uh, Carlos Newton, my second fight, who was the former champ, which I tried to get the Lala fight before they made me fight uh, Newton. And when I say made me fight, literally they made me fight Newton. Uh, I said I didn't want that fight. They told me, well, you don't have to take that fight, but we don't know when we'll have you back. So that's basically either take the fight or sit on the bench. So I took the fight, lost the fight, of course, to Newton. And then that's my second fight on my contract. So now, they, Lawler was killing everybody, destroying everybody. So now they give me Lawler with my uh, last fight on my contract. I'm thinking, I mean, I can't know for sure, but I'm thinking it's my last fight on my contract. They match me up with Lawler. Lawler beats me. Then they don't have to deal with, with me no more because that's the final fight on my contract. Well, I beat Lawler, which I knew I was going to beat Lawler. It was, it was a no-brainer. Um, that was one of those things that... You know, there's a certain fight that you go into and you know that it's already been decided and that you're gonna be the winner. And that's what it was. I mean, I wasn't nervous. I had the utmost confidence that I was gonna beat him. And, uh, and, and that's what happened. I mean, that fight camp was relatively easy. I mean, as far as the game plan, game plan was easy. Uh, the training was hard as shit. I mean, Saxon, when I say training me Thai style, I would train, I remember one time specifically, I trained a 23 minute round with no breaks. I would hit pads with Sykes on. Uh, Deborah would hold, Deborah was my boxing coach. Um, she would hold the, the mitts for me, for my hands. And then I would be sparring with Jason and, uh, and Joe Garcia, Jason House and Joe Garcia would be my sparring partners. They would be clinching me, trying to take me down. And then I'd get back up. Then I'm kicking pads again with Saxon. And so this is going on over and over for 23 minutes. Saxon, look at the clock. Okay, we're going to stop on the two. Which, and then I look up and the second hand is already past the freaking five. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, that's how hard I trained. I could go 23 minutes, not stop and not get tired. And uh, you know that we knew we were gonna beat the, beat Lala, and uh, you know it was just one of those things. That we beat him, and then they wanted to offer me a title shot next, and you know those turns didn't come to fruition for one reason or another. Um, the similarities with training with. Saxon and Mark Delagrati is our background is kind of basically the same. I met Mark Delagrati on the Ultimate Fighter. He was the Muay Thai coach on the Ultimate Fighter. And uh, when he saw me move, he was like, You must train with Saxon. 
because Sitka Tongue is, is our background. So our Saxon, that background over in Thailand is Sitka Tongue back, background. So we, we train very, very similar as far as being very technical with our Muay Thai. Uh, you got some Muay Thai systems that are hard systems, uh, almost kind of like the, the, the Taekwondo theory of one punch, one kill. Uh, everything is hard, but for us in, in Thai, which you know Mark taught me in Thai, he said our styles are Muay Shalat, which is very technical, is what that means. And uh, But training with Mark was just, uh, it was a good time training with Mark. I mean, they each have their, they each have different things that they do. But overall, it felt like I was still training with Saxon uh, during certain parts. Uh, Mark Delagrati's boxing, his hand game, is a little is a little more polished uh, for for a Thai style than than it was when I was training with Saxon. But really, that was the only difference. Is Mark kind of can incorporate like a back boxing type of hand hand sets uh, in the training, but. Overall, the, the training styles were very similar, very similar. Mostly everybody that we trained with, at some point or another, got to the show. I know when I started training with Saul Solis, uh, there was a lot of us on the show, man. There was, uh, it was me, Eve Edwards, Kevin Randleman, Tito Ortiz, Rico Rodriguez, uh, who else? Yeah, it was, it, it was a lot of us like that at one point. Like, like we were Jacksons and American Top Team way before they even ever existed. Like, we, we had a squad of dudes. I mean, just think about those names. Eve Edwards, Rico Rodriguez, Kevin Randleman, Tito Ortiz, like, we had some big names in the gym. And then at the same time, I got to train with people like Guy Mesker, Trey Telegman, um, Pete Williams, uh, that whole that whole Lions Den group. I mean, man, I've been fortunate enough to train with a lot, a lot of the big names that's been in the sport. I trained with Boss Rudin a little bit before. Like, like it's been, it's been a good time, man. Uh, it was worse. Those training sessions back then with those guys was worse because that's that's our old school training. I try to I try to incorporate some of the old school with the new school here uh, in today's game, but back then, man, it, it was crazy. I remember sparring with with Trey Telegram one time, and uh, I got hit with a body shot that I didn't see, and I thought I shit my pants. Like it it was incredible. I, I took a knee. My boxing coach at the time was Phil. And he was like, get up, you gotta finish. So I got my ass up and finished the round, but I thought I was gonna die, dude, for real. Like, like back then, it was crazy. It was crazy, a lot, a lot of people. And then training with Saul, back then, a lot of the dudes, the way we trained back then, a lot of the dudes today would not be able to take it. Those training sessions, they would quit. Um, probably the most exciting um, promotion that I've been a part of just because it was different or it was my first time was when, uh, when I was training Chris Brennan and I cornered him for Pride Bushido. And we talking 75,000 people in the arena. And when the fights are going on, like you can hear a pin drop because the crowd is so educated with what's going on. You could hear a pin drop in that place. I'm talking 75,000 people and the respect for the sport that's allowing you to be able to corner your fighter without having to raise your voice. That was the most satisfying and weird experience at the same time like how you get in the stadium with 70,000 people and you can literally hear a pin drop during the fight yeah that that was crazy for me that was a great experience it's the first time I went to Japan and uh, got to experience that environment and yeah that was a great great environment
when you talk about excitement, um, crowd in a frenzy was cornering Diego in Dublin versus Conor McGregor. That scene, it was a smaller, more intimate venue. I want to say it might have been, it might have seated maybe 8,500 or so, but like it was like standing room only, talking like, like, like a world championship bout versus number one and number two in the world. Like, like it was, it was, it was that type of atmosphere. Like that atmosphere was lit. That's the most exciting atmosphere that I, I'd ever been in. Like I got chills when we were doing the walkout. Like we talking like standing room only, 8,500 plus Irish fans and we're the enemy. Now imagine that going into enemy territory. It was unbelievable. It's, a, it's an experience that I have yet to experience. I mean, I fought in front of 17,000 people myself for UFC 69 in Houston. It was nothing like that environment over in Dublin. I mean, the, the partnership between me and Rodrigo began, you know, over 10 years ago. I think we've been, we've been together, we've been in business together for 10 years, but I think our relationship is more like 11, 11 to 12 years is our, our training relationship. I want to say we started training maybe a year after I got here to San Antonio. I got in San Antonio in uh, 2006, I got in San Antonio. And I think me and Rodrigo started training together in 2007. Um, and uh, there was a guy that knew both of us. And, uh, you know, I was one of the best dudes at striking out here. Rodrigo's one of the best ground dudes out here. And he was like, hey, I want you to meet this guy. I think y'all will be great training partners together. Uh, he has great jujitsu and you got great striking. And we met and pretty much it's history from that point on. Uh, you know, Rodrigo is my brother and uh, at one point, we decided that uh, we wanted to we wanted to go into business together because we we didn't want to depend on because we used to rent space from uh, from other gyms just to be able to uh, to get our people to be able to work out and stuff. And then uh, we ended up buying the we ended up leasing the old place where we where we met, which was at Power Power Team Jiu Jitsu off of off of Brook Hollow. We ended up leasing that little building, and then we just started our foundation from there which grew into this location that we have now. And uh, now we're getting ready to expand and move out of this location and build our, our new location from the ground up. And it's gonna be almost 10,000 square feet. And, you know, like I said before, the sky's the limit once we get that up. We're gonna have so many different programs and so many things that we're able to do uh, as far as scheduling and being able to do classes simultaneously. Because right now with the limited space that we have, there's certain things that I can't do because the mass space is being used, certain things he can't do because the mass space is being used by me. But once we get to get this new place, it's, it's going to be it's going to be incredible. But uh, but yeah, man, we met. Uh, we be we became great training partners and we became like brothers. And, uh, you know, we, we did whatever we had to do to make sure that we put our brand together. And when we when we decided that we were going to open a gym together, Everything just just kind of took off from there, and you know, if you think about it, if you look at a lot of the gyms around San Antonio, we're the only gym that's had basically the longevity of any other gyms that's been out here uh, so far. Uh, we talking ten years. I don't know how many gyms that are out there uh, that's been around ten years. Uh, I think Crew Pet's been around a long time because he was here when I, I trained with him when I first got here. But if you look at a lot of these other gyms, they're either combining gyms or one gym is buying out another gym. But, you know, we've been self-contained and self-run for the past 10 years.